How we doing, everyone? Welcome back to another edition of FSI's PGA DFS Pick Show. I am your host, TK Nation 47 joined with John Cool19. We are filming on a Monday, uh, just kind of trying to get all our content in for the week with the Wednesday start, uh, with the Farmers deciding not to go up against the NFL Sunday. Uh, so we come to bring this. What's up? It's smart. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're bringing you a uh, early release of the video show. So, uh, John, just give me a quick rundown of uh, how things went last week and what we we're going to expect for the Farmers ins Insurance Open. Sure. Uh, some good and some bad. The, my cash lineups were junk, so uh, really it struggled to get anything going on the week. Uh, we had Tom Hoagie on as one of the sleepers last week. That was an excellent choice. Uh, didn't quite hit any of the top guys. I had Swafford in the pool, but couldn't get him paired up with Hoagie or really anyone else in the top 15 for that matter. My best line still had just five out of six golfers. Uh, that was better than all of my, my, my few six out of six lineups. So not a great week, but uh, at least made, uh, made the cut in one and done ready to move on to a better event. We talked about it last week. That event just is super goofy. Three courses, um, pro-am. There's just a lot of things not to like necessarily about the Amex, there's a lot more to like here about Farmers Insurance Open, uh, especially the field. How do you, what are you thinking about the, the field this week? Pretty stacked field. A lot of, uh, I would consider soft pricing. Um, but, you know, in general, this this brings out the best of the golfers year, of year in and year out. Uh, they love to play Torrey Pines, a very historical course. We know we played this uh, for the U.S. Open last year. Um, yeah, two courses. It's going to be a blast. So, um yeah, let's get into it. Let's get to the favorite picks. Um, Should we do a start us off? rundown on the course? Oh, I thought, okay, yeah, go ahead and run down the course. Sorry. Sure. Go. No, no problem. So just a, a quick couple notes. They are playing two courses, day one and day two. This is Torrey Pines, north and south. The south course is the main course. They'll play that on both Friday and Saturday. It's really weird saying that. Uh, and then once on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, but it is the much tougher course. So if you're playing showdown, absolutely six out of six golfers, no questions asked, play all guys on the North course. Don't screw that up. That's super easy to do. A lot of people will be like, oh, this guy shot so well yesterday. He's going to be playing great round two. Yeah. Problem is he's playing on a course that's two strokes harder. Don't do it. Play guys on the South court. I'm sorry. Play guys on the North course in rounds one and two in your showdown lineups, stack those up. And then looking at the weather, it looks like it's coming to, going to come in really windy on Friday. Uh, so that's kind of our day to be more concerned with uh, uh, stacking as far as AM PM wave. We'll kind of be getting into that in the discord chat as we get closer. I'm not going to concern myself at all with weather when it comes to the classic slate, uh, but that's something to keep in mind as we get later in the week. The South course, this is the tougher of the two courses, 7,700 yards. This will be the longest course that they play on on the PGA Tour this season. North course is only 7,200 yards. They're both seven, par 72s. Uh, so it's got the four par fives, but super, super long. You do need to kind of be longer off the tee, or at least it helps. It's not a must. There's been a couple of golfers, some Snedekers and stuff out there who've excelled, but uh, it takes either excellent, excellent putting or average putting. Plus you got to have some distance and excellent approach on this course. Super long roughs here. Usually uh, the U S open was even tougher than that, but still they have a long rough here and it's one of the hardest fairways to hit on tour. So guys are going to miss the fairways. There's smaller greens. Guys are going to miss. We're going to focus a lot more around the greens short game. Uh, those are going to be much more important this week. And definitely that driving distance I'll include in the modeling. Just one last note, really uh, a a week to week, we love to talk about form. How have guys done in their last four or five events, even five, six, seven events? What have they been doing lately? This is not nearly as important this week because all of the last few tournaments have been birdie fests. And we're looking at a very tough course that's going to have something a winner could be under 10, 11 under par might be the winning score this week. Uh, so trying to compare that to 31 under par or whatever Cam Smith had back at the Century Tournament of Champions. It's just goofy to try and compare the two events. So recent form is not nearly as important this week. Uh, we want golfers who are playing well, uh, but not necessarily guys who had to excel over the last handful of events. So that's kind of where I've been building my models this week. Uh, long approach shots, um, so proximity from 175 and even 200 plus 
uh, are important this week as well. But I think that probably wraps it up for most of my focuses for the um, for my stat modeling. We'll have more of that in our chat. This is just kind of early, but uh, that's as good as we've got here uh, to dig in for the week. Yeah, absolutely. Can could not agree more about um, the course history take. I think that's a really strong one. Um, definitely not. I'm looking at recent form, but more yeah. or less from from just the statistics I'm looking at um, individual, you know, specifically that are geared towards the course, maybe not just in general strokes gain statistics. There's a lot of intricate st uh, stats and analytics that I kind of love to look at like those kind of trends as we head into a place like this, where it's a very specific style of play. Um, yeah. So with that being said, now we'll get into the picks. Uh, stop rushing us along here. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I'm going to start us off with uh, Sam Burns, um, you know, going through my one and done selection. Um, I, I've actually formulated a pretty good process. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but, you know, Sam Burns was definitely on that radar. He's already been priced down uh, in the betting market. He started out opening at 30 to one. He's now down to 20 to one. People are slamming the money on Burns. The books are going to get crushed if Burns wins this event this week. I think he makes for a really strong play at 9,700. Plays long iron courses very well. He is a preferred Bermuda specialist as far as putting goes. Uh, but we've seen, you know, Burns kind of transition into, you know, maybe like the model, like I would say tier B uh, golfer as far as talent level. Uh, he's really came alive uh, and, and, you know, just kind of turned the page from, you know, made cuts in, in top 30s. He's starting to rattle off top 10s and wins. Yeah. He's got two uh, with the Sanderson Farms. He's got a Valspar, which is a long Bermuda course in Florida that's really hard track. Um, he plays, you know, he's played specifically well to this course, as I mentioned, 14th on approach. Uh, he's first in par four threes from 200 to 225. Uh, there's four of them on the north course, uh, really long par threes. There's quite a few on the south as well. Um, and he avoids three putts, uh, whether he's on Bermuda or not. So I'm going to keep, I mean, he played 19th at the century. Um, you know, he didn't really knock, knock any doors down at that, at the century, but Hey, I mean, he was coming off of a long layoff, he just got his feet wet. Um, maybe he wasn't ready. And maybe now he steps into the ring this week, ready to roll. Uh, hopefully Sam Burns. Uh, pulls out a very strong finish. Uh, your thoughts on him and who is your favorite of the week? I, I love the Sam Burns pick. I think he is a great option. If you can get there price-wise in your cash lineups, I think that's an excellent spot to start. Uh, 9,700 is a very, very fair price for him. I like it a lot. You're absolutely right. As far as outright bets go, um, he would be a, certainly a guy to target this week, uh, along with another guy I'll talk about in a few minutes. But for me, Justin Thomas up top, really, it's tough. I wanted to pick Rom kind of, sort of, again. I mean, he won on this course at the U.S. Open. He's also won on this course previously, so two-time winner on the course. Um, but uh, the thing that scares me, really, is last week he played fine in a birdie fest. This is going to be a better suit for him. He plays really well in these difficult courses. But the ownership, it's it's just kind of out of control. He's projected to be the highest owned golfer again this week. So I'm going to kind of, and this is something I tend to do quite a bit at the top of the DFS pricing, is just slip down. Justin Thomas is not way worse of a golfer. Um, he's going to win quite, uh, not nearly as often as Rom probably, but close to it. And for him to be half the ownership of John Rom, I'm going to bite at that every single time I see that. Uh, so for me, it's really a leverage play more than anything else. Although he has been playing really good golf lately, he was fifth at the Tournament of Champions and then third back at Mayakoba. Over his last 10 events, four of those are top five finishes, and he didn't play a ton of the swing events. So more of those last 10 events are headed back in towards uh, the playoff last year, et cetera. Um, so I like that quite a bit for JT. He comes out number three overall in my model. John Rahm was number one in my model. Again, this is a big uh, ownership leverage play for me. He has not played at this course since 2015, and he actually missed the cut that year. But the year before that, he was 10th place. I'm really looking at guys who have at least had one top 10 or so. If I'm going to pay this much of a price tag, I want somebody who's had a top 10 at this course. So he does check that box. Um, and then he also has that top five earlier this year. I'm looking for guys who have at least played one event this year um, and then had at least some success in that one event. That's important to me this week. 
Poa is JT's best putting surface. He excels on hard courses. Um, and really, if I if you look back at 2014 when he finished top 10, he was insane with the putter. I am I modeled in just putting at Torrey Pines into my model this week. I think it's important to be able to putt well, not just on Poa, but to putt well here at this course. They are very difficult greens. Uh, so I like that. He's great on approach, eighth in ball striking. 23rd in distance, um, and again, half the ownership of Rom. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat that every time. Yeah, I like JT. I think he's a strong play. I think he fared pretty well for the U.S. Open when they played. Um, you know, I think he was inside the top 10, I believe. I'm not. I, don't quote me on that, but I think he. I remember his name being mentioned uh, when it came down to it. So I don't mind the JT play. Uh, moving on to some value here, um, we're gonna go with uh, Tony Finau. And nope, there we go. Ryan Palmer and Francesco Molinari. Palmer, 8,100, 60 to 1, uh, 10th at the at the Sony Open. He has excellent course history. He's got two runner ups here um, from proximity from 200 yards, uh, not just par threes. He's he's third in my model. Um, he can really stretch the field, uh, stretch the field with his uh, long iron play. I think his ownership is going to be quite low. Uh, he is in a stacked part of the uh, odds and uh, price list here. You have players like Buzayden Hope, um, you know, McNeely is right there at 8,200 as well. I like him uh, with, he had a 27th at the Sony earlier, a 15th in 2020 and a 29th in 2018. So McNeely probably going to have some ownership this week. Yep. I think the Zayden Ho, as mentioned, um, I believe Max Home is there at 84. He's got two wins in California. And I think Ryan Palmer, you know, with the two runner ups, he might go forgotten here as a guy, you know, older, older guy. People may think he's, uh, uh, you know, washed, but, you know, Palmer's actually played a lot of his best golf in recent years. So I like him and Molinari, uh, 7,600 coming off of a sixth place finish at the American Express. Um, he really should have top five. He should have been second, but he missed three putted from seven feet on the last hole. Yikes. Um, yeah. 80. Yeah. It was, it was, it was probably crushing if you had a top five bet. Um, but yeah, Hey, 80 to one this week. I think that's actually a really strong number. He has a relatively good course history. Um, you know, I think he has like a five, four out of the last four made cuts here. Um, he had a, fin a 13th place finish at the U.S. Open, too, um, and he wasn't playing his best golf last year. So Molinari um, is going to be probably popular, but yeah, I'm going to go ahead and play him at 7,600 and uh, probably going to be cash viable for me this week. What are your thoughts on those two value plays? Yeah, absolutely. Molinari popped for me as well, just uh, having – Although we had the down year last year, playing well on this course piques my interest quite a bit. Uh, uh, you mentioned McNeely. I really like him. I think he's going to be super, super chalky, which I think just like you said, leads to Palmer probably having a little dip in ownership. Uh, but he's got excellent course history too. So I, I I do like both of these guys quite a bit. For me, I went a little higher for my first value play in Tony Finau. Good old backwards hat Tony here. Um Really, for, for me, the course history is just very, very tough to ignore with Tony. Uh, he has played in his last seven years. He made all seven cuts. His worst was 24th, and that was seven years ago. He went 24th, 18th, 4th, 6th, 13th, 6th, and then runner-up last year. That's just way too good to ignore. I think the price is excellent at 9100 I think he was like almost 10 k at this event last year, finished second place, and now we get him at 9.1 on DraftKings. Um, so for me, this is a big value play. I'm looking at his uh, uh, world golf ranking. He is 10th uh, overall in this field, yet he's the 14th price. In my model, he's ninth, and then the odds, he's ninth. So I think you're getting good value at the 9,100, just looking at those. Uh, and then you toss in course history and the stats as well. Uh, he plays really well on hard courses, and he absolutely crushes the north course. He is in the top couple golfers when it's strokes gained on that north course. Really, if you look at it, if you don't go four, five, six under par at that north course, you can't win this event. you got to play the one day super, super low, and then – hang on tight in the south course make a lot of pars and you have an excellent chance to be at the top of the leaderboard and tony Finau fits that bill 
Uh, his last the stat modeling, it doesn't actually actually love Tony Finau. He hasn't had the best stats over the last six months or so. What I am looking at, he has been very good at the proximity from 200 plus. Uh, and then just overall, he's not bad at anything. He's above average driving distance, ball striking, approach, scrambling around the greens. He definitely is not excelling in any one category uh, like a couple of the other guys we like this week. But he is just above average in everything. And I like that quite a bit on Tony Finau. Uh, he also had a fifth place at Tournament of Champions, so he's got that uh, checks that box for me as well. His win was at the Northern Trust last year, and uh, he really he's only got one missed cut out of his last 10, 10 events. Super consistent for Tony Finau. Uh, the other guy I'm looking at for value here, I had him as a value play last week. That is Luke List. Finished 22nd, which was just fine for his pricing. He dropped down, uh, I think, $500 or so on DraftKings. Uh, 70 to 1 betting market. I don't think Luke List is going to win this week. I do think Tony Fina has a great chance to win. But Luke List, to me, is much better DraftKings play. Uh, his last 10 events, he's made 70% of the cuts. And he was uh, as three top 11 finishes. I mentioned that last week. Uh, something with Luke List, though, he plays really well on these difficult courses. He plays really well in windy conditions as well. He is an awful putter. But this course, again, you, you don't necessarily have to be the best putter coming in. You just have to putt well here. And actually, Poa being his best uh, putting surface, he's actually putted here pretty well when you're comparing Luke List to Luke List everywhere else. Uh, so I like that quite a bit. Um, and, and all the reasons I went through last week, he's a very good ball striker, uh, really good on approach as well. Uh, so I'm going to take some Luke List in my DraftKings lineups this week as well. Yeah, he, he super popped on probably on probably both of our models this week, Luke List. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. He's got like every every one of those like proximity yardages, par four scoring from 450 to 500. He, he really nailed it on the model this week. I mean, he's not the, you know, the putting if, if he decides to, you know, lose five strokes putting, there's nothing you can do about that. But from a yeah. strokes gain metrics and, and a modeling standpoint, Luke List probably grades out the best value uh, on the board with yeah the, with well the and then the model shakes out yeah and then when you include the course history and such he's made five out of seven cuts playing at this event that's excellent for a guy priced down here he's made his last four cuts at this event that includes 12th place in 18th and 2018 yeah. and 10th place last year so i mean i think you're yeah. getting an excellent chance at a top 15 guy um again i don't think luke Bliss is going to win this week Give me Tony, Tony Fiume out of win. Uh, but but yeah, the value is just tough to ignore on DraftKings. I'm going to play a lot of Luke List, I think, and uh, definitely in the options for uh, cash play for me. Even though last week I said I wouldn't do it, I didn't do it, I should have done it, and this week I might. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to the sleeper slide, uh, I'm going to talk about Kevin Tway, 6,200. 400 to one uh totally Ooh. not going to win but you are probably going to get some decent odds on that top 20 bet mm -hmm. uh, so look for tway as a top 20 he's got some solid course history he's made four out of the last five cuts here uh great scrambler um really what i was looking for in my sleeper this week i wasn't going to try to find a guy that was perfect in the model you just won't down here below the 7k mark you're not going to find much uh as far as you know top <laughs> tens in the previous farmers insurance opens either uh so what you're trying to find is you're trying to find a guy that fits the course right and i think kevin tway really fits the course really solid from over 200 yards and on those par threes from 200 to 225 uh he scores well on par long par fours and uh hey i mean he golfed earlier this year i believe he was in the century so he's already got a tournament under his belt as well um, so give me Tway as a scrambler. Um, hopefully he makes enough putts and he's got some course history. Hopefully he can replicate it. Maybe get us a top 20, 6,200. I'm, I'm looking to just cram in the studs with him anyway. So if yeah. they go off and Tway makes a cut, then I'm looking good. And that's what I'm really going to go for with Tway. Uh, your thoughts on that and who is your sleeper? Yeah, and I think Tway gives you uh, great ownership. You're going to be able to get basically a combination of two three yeah. popular golfers and still be unique no matter what uh, you do with the rest of your line if you include Tway. so for me i don't i actually think uh, bramlett might end up being just a little more popular here yeah. the 67 hundred price tag is really good 200 to one on DraftKings sportsbook but i'm seeing him as low as 150 to one over on bovada so i, I really don't think I, 
I think the 200 to one is excellent, especially if you're going top 10 or top 20 bets. Um, but uh, that number is not as good elsewhere, which I think just shows that he is probably a better golfer than the 200 to one shows here. He did finish 18th at the Farmers last year. I like that a lot. Um, at 2011, he missed the cut a long time ago, but he was 45th the year before that. So 45th and 18th the last two years. Not many guys in the 6K range are going to be able to say that. He was 33rd at the Amex. 20 at Sony, so he's playing decent golf as well. And then fourth in driving distance uh, for Bramlett, so he's going to be long off the tee, 10th greens in regulation. He's a top 20, both at ball striking and approach as well in this field. For a really tough field, I would I was super surprised to see him top 20 when it comes to ball striking. I think he uh, is an excellent option to finish up your DFS lineups down here. Got to keep an eye on the ownership if it gets I, I, I have no idea. I haven't looked at it, but if it gets up there for a guy at 6,700, uh, might be a fade opportunity for me. But uh, for me right now, I really love uh, Bramlett a whole lot. Yeah, Bramlett, um, he's been really on fire lately, and he played pretty well, I believe, at the Sony. Yeah, uh, 20th. Some, yeah, I love some coastal courses. Um, all right, moving on to the one and done slide. Um, I have pretty i've formulated a pretty good strategy going so far i'm in 186 um with the t3 from powers then the solo ninth from cantlay now people would argue you know i only got a ninth place finish out of cantlay but hey um it's 200 and something k i'll take it uh it's keeping me inside that top 250 that is my goal to try to stay within that two top 250 so i'm just going to keep trying to take shots at guys that I think can win. Sanders Shoffley, uh, a guy I didn't mention in my favorite slide or in value or anything like that, but Shoffley is one of these guys that loves the course. Uh, you know, they had quote unquote targeted this as his home course. He finished second last uh, year at the Farmers. He was top five, I believe, at the U.S. Open or top 10 at the U.S. Open uh, when it was at the Farmers or at the uh, Torrey Pines. Uh, but yeah, Xander... Uh, loves Polo Greens, loves California golf. Now, people would argue this is usually a guy you take in no-cut events. Most of his wins, if you look, are in smaller fields. Uh, you can mention that with, like, the International uh, you know, Olympics that he, he just won, small field, no-cut event. Uh, that's kind of his style. But I think he gets on the board here with a win at um, – Tory Pines, he gets it crossed off the bucket list. I'm going to take a shot. I'm going to keep trying to pound out top tens until I can find some winners. And uh, hopefully this is going to be the strategy going forward and hopefully it works. Your thoughts? Yep. I, th I think Xander is a great play. He had an awesome year at Torrey Pines last year with the two events. Uh, yeah, I think he might have been sixth. And then I, I did look it up. JT was 19th at the U.S. Open. So um, although he hasn't played this event in a handful of years, certainly it was up there in the leaderboard last year. Uh, but for me, Tony Finau, I don't necessarily think I'll see myself taking him elsewhere throughout this year. He is a top 20 world golf ranking golfer. I think this is as good as any event when it comes to his course history. Um, and where he, uh, if he can just be consistent with what he's done in the past, get me a top 10 and uh, move me up the leaderboard here. Uh, so I, I like Tony Fino quite a bit. Uh, I certainly wouldn't fault anybody for trying to go up to the top and, and taking Rom either. Um, you, you might feel bad if he finishes, you know, 14th or 15th and you don't have him later on. But uh, if he goes out and wins, you're going to put yourself right in the mix of things because I don't he's not going to get the ownership this week that uh, he probably deserves for being best golfer in the world and also uh, has crushed this course recently. Um, I did look at the world golf rankings and was kind of reading up this week. If Rom falters and Morikawa gets a win overseas, Morikawa will become the number one golfer in the world. What do you think about that? Wow, Colin Morikawa. Look yeah. how far look how far the Morikawa the cowbell Ooh. has come. All cool? the way to the top. That's awesome. I remember we played him in the pandemic year right out the gate, you know, he was crushing it, won the 3M or he yeah, he, he finished a runner up to Wolf at the 3M. That's right. And then he ended up going on to win the PGA Championship later on that year and and we've been big fans this whole entire time. And now he might be in world number one, simply incredible. And big, yep. big Morikawa fans from uh, this day, you know, from that day and into many more years to come. All right. 
John, that'll probably wrap things up for our pick show this week, guys. Thank you for listening in. You can follow in, follow me at TK nation 47. That is John Cole 19. Follow us on our Twitter handle at FSI underscore DFS. Uh, you can join our discord. You can find us on our website as well. All the cores are posted to both the discord and the website. So you can find all our content all over the FSI map. So thank you for listening, John. Good luck this week. Let's hope for a good week and uh, a Saturday finish going to be the first one I've seen in geez. I don't know. I, Many, many forever days. yeah <laughs> that's fine that'll that'll give us time to watch the 49ers and make it to the super bowl this week that's right big 49er fan right here so uh big big game coming up uh hopefully uh they pull it off and uh get some money dfs on saturday and then uh you know flip it on sunday <laughs> <laughs> throwing it all on the niners i love it Why not? all right john thank you for uh right. joining me this evening and enjoy your lineups and good luck everyone good luck